Across India, over 100 million tribal people live on land labeled worthless, rocky and rain-fed, neglected even by government programs. One acre changed that. But against expert advice, one quiet experiment planted 50 trees on just one acre, and it triggered a transformation for 200,000 families, reclaiming 81,000 hectares. How did a forgotten community turn deprivation into a model now studied worldwide? Before this orchard blueprint, tribal prospects looked hopeless. So what changed, and why did it work where everything else failed? Across central, eastern, and northeastern India, entire generations of tribal families have lived on land others dismissed as hopeless. These are not the lush valleys or fertile plains that fill textbooks. Instead, the landscape is defined by rocky slopes, thin soils, and fields that depend on a single burst of monsoon rain. For more than 100 million tribal people, this is home, a patchwork of uplands where each year brings the same question. Will the land provide enough to survive? The odds have always been stacked against them. Nearly 90% of tribal farmland is rain-fed, with no irrigation to buffer against drought. When the rain fails, the soil turns hard and unyielding. Even in good years, the best that many fields offer is a thin crop of millet or pulses, barely enough to last through the lean months. For families, the promise of the land is often broken by erosion, wildfires, and the steady loss of forest resources that once filled the gaps. Livelihoods hang by a thread. With little to harvest and no savings to fall back on, the poverty cycle tightens its grip. Young men and women, seeing no future in farming, leave for distant cities. In tribal districts of Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, and Charkhand, up to 60% of households report at least one member migrating each year, most for low-wage construction jobs or seasonal labor. This pattern of migration leaves villages quieter, fields untended, and local traditions fading as elders age alone. Government programs, when they arrive at all, tend to focus on more accessible, fertile areas. The unique challenges of tribal uplands, steep slopes, scattered plots, and lack of infrastructure mean that large-scale irrigation or fertilizer schemes rarely reach these communities. For decades, policy has overlooked the reality that most tribal land is simply not suited to conventional farming. As a result, more than 80 million people remain locked out of progress, their land and labor undervalued. The depth of this crisis is measured not just in statistics, but in daily choices. Should a family risk another season of failed crops or send their children to the city in search of work? Should they clear more forest for shifting cultivation, knowing it will only yield less each year? For many, the land is both inheritance and burden, a resource that cannot be sold, improved, or abandoned without loss. It is a quiet emergency, hidden in plain sight, demanding a solution that fits the land itself. In the mid-1980s, a small team from BAIF Development Research Foundation arrived in the Vansda Hills of Gujarat with a different question. Instead of asking how to force more crops from tired soil, they wondered if the land itself could be reimagined. The solution they piloted was simple and radical. Treat one acre as a living system, not just a field. The blueprint called for 50 to 60 fruit trees, mango, cashew, custard apple, planted in the heart of each acre. Around the edges, a protective border of forest species stood guard, chosen for their ability to shelter young saplings from wind, browsing animals, and the relentless summer sun. This fruit inside, forest outside configuration became more than a pattern. It was a shield and a promise. The border trees, teak, bamboo, or local timber species kept out monkeys, deer, and stray cattle problems that had plagued earlier attempts at orchard farming. Inside the fruit trees were space to allow their canopies to grow wide, soaking up sunlight and moisture even on sloped rocky ground. In the first three years while the trees found their footing, families planted vegetables and legumes between the rows. These intercrops, beans, gourds, leafy greens, provided quick harvests and a steady supply of food, making use of every patch of open soil before the orchard matured. 
The intercrops provided short-term income and food security while the trees grew. The first pilots faced skepticism. Local farmers doubted that degraded land, dismissed for generations, could support so many trees. Early failures were common, poor soil meant slow growth, and wildlife raids sometimes wiped out entire sections overnight. Yet the design invited adaptation. Baif engineers introduced contour buns to trap rainwater, fencing to deter animals, and drought-tolerant grafts that could survive long dry spells. Each setback became a lesson, and each lesson refined the one-acre model. By the fourth or fifth year, the first flush of mangoes and cashews signaled the experiment was working. For families used to foraging in shrinking forests, these harvests brought not just food, but a new sense of possibility. The orchard was no longer a gamble, it was a system engineered for the land's limits and its potential. The idea of one acre, 50 to 60 trees, and a living border had moved from blueprint to reality, offering a practical path out of the cycle of scarcity. Every successful orchard begins not with planting, but with careful measurement. On a one-acre plot, each fruit tree, mango, cashew, custard apple, or citrus, is given its own space, typically 10 meters apart in a grid. This precision allows canopies to expand without crowding, ensuring that sunlight and air reach every leaf. The choice of grafted saplings is deliberate. Local rootstock, selected for drought endurance, is paired with high-yielding scions, so each tree can survive harsh summers and deliver reliable harvests as it matures. The border is just as intentional. Along the perimeter, families plant two to three rows of forest species, teak, bamboo, or hardy local timber. These trees stand as living fences, breaking the wind, deterring stray cattle, and providing a steady supply of poles and fodder. In many regions, thorny shrubs are added to reinforce the boundary, a natural barrier against wildlife. This outer ring is not an afterthought, it is the first line of defense, protecting the young orchard inside. Water is the hidden engine behind the system. Before a single sapling goes into the ground, technicians survey the slope and soil. They mark out contour trenches, shallow ditches that snake across the hillside, following the land's natural curves. When the monsoon arrives, these trenches capture runoff, holding water long enough for it to seep into the ground instead of washing precious topsoil away. In flatter areas, small farm ponds are dug where water naturally collects. These ponds store rain for the dry months, making it possible to irrigate young trees during their most vulnerable years. Mulch, layers of leaves, crop residue, and organic matter is spread thickly around each pit. This simple step keeps moisture in the soil and feeds the roots as it breaks down. For the first two or three years, the gaps between trees are filled with quick-growing vegetables and legumes. These intercrops cover the ground, shade out weeds, and provide food and income while the orchard matures. Nothing is wasted. Every square meter serves a purpose. The technical blueprint is more than a list of parts. It is a system where each element, spacing, fencing, water harvesting, and intercropping works together. The result is not just a field of trees, but a living machine engineered to turn even the poorest land into a source of stability and growth. Transforming a barren acre into a thriving orchard begins with a simple calculation. For most tribal families, the initial investment is $300 to $500. This covers everything, saplings for fruit and forest trees, digging pits, fencing, and construction of water harvesting structures such as contour trenches and small ponds. It is not a grant or a handout. It is a targeted investment designed to launch a system that runs on its own once established. The timeline is measured in seasons, not decades. In the first year, families plant vegetables and legumes like beans, gourds, and leafy greens between the young trees. These quick-growing intercrops deliver food for the table and cash for the household, often bringing in an extra $100 to $200 a year during the orchard's early stages. This bridge income turns the waiting period into a productive phase, letting families see the land's value before the first fruit harvest. From the third to the fifth year, the orchard begins to mature. Mangoes and cashews, once just saplings, start to bear. Annual returns climb steadily, reaching $800 to $1,500 at full maturity. 
For families used to scraping by on subsistence crops, this is a three to five fold increase, an income that can send children to school, pay for medical care, or rebuild a home after a storm. The orchard itself becomes a living asset, with the value of mature trees and timber rising over time. Returns grow as the trees age and the household gains financial stability. This return on investment stands in stark contrast to traditional government programs. Conventional schemes, often focused on irrigation or fertilizer subsidies, can cost $3,000 to $10,000 per family and still struggle to deliver lasting change. The Wadi model, at one-tenth the cost, produces a self-sustaining system that requires no ongoing inputs, no annual budget approvals, and no dependency on outside aid. Once the orchard is established, the land works for the family, not the other way around. The financial logic is clear. For a modest outlay, families gain a permanent productive asset that multiplies their income and grows in value year after year. The numbers prove what the eye can see, degraded land turned into an engine of prosperity, not by charity, but by design. The reach of the Wadi model is not a matter of hopeful estimates or isolated success stories. It is documented in thousands of field records, audits, and independent evaluations. NABARD, India's apex rural development bank, has tracked the expansion of these integrated orchards from their early days in Gujarat to their current footprint across 25 states. Project files and evaluation reports confirm that more than 200,000 tribal families now manage one-acre orchards designed on the Wadi blueprint. These are not demonstration plots or pilot cases. Each number represents a household with a mapped plot, a record of sapling survival, and a documented income change. The physical scale is just as striking. Over 81,000 hectares of degraded land, once written off as unproductive, now support living systems of fruit and forest trees. This scale is visible across regions that were once dismissed as hopeless. State after state, from the rocky uplands of Maharashtra to the arid stretches of Rajasthan and the humid hills of the Northeast, has adopted and adapted the model. Each region brings its own tweaks, cashew and mango in the west, citrus and mahua in the east, drought-resistant species in dry zones. Yet the core design, 50 to 60 fruit trees inside, forest borders outside, water harvesting throughout, remains constant. The core idea is simple, and it fits degraded land. Verification goes beyond paperwork. NABARD's Tribal Development Fund requires periodic audits, with field teams visiting villages to count surviving trees, check water structures, and interview families about income and food security. This verification is part of the program's strength. In Odisha, for example, a recent evaluation covered 61 projects, documenting over 46,000 farmers and more than 17,000 hectares of new orchards. Similar evaluations appear in Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Gujarat, where local NGOs and state agencies submit detailed progress reports, often with geotagged photos and survival rates for every cluster of orchards. Perhaps the most convincing evidence comes from the way the model spreads. Success is visible. When one family's orchard begins to yield fruit and timber, three or four neighboring households typically adopt the design within five years, without outside incentives. This farmer-to-farmer -farmer replication has been observed in hundreds of villages, creating a multiplier effect that outpaces most government-led schemes. The numbers, 200,000 families, 81,000 hectares, 25 states, are not projections. They are the measured outcome of a design that proves itself, acre by acre, across every region it touches. Ownership has always defined who thrives and who remains on the margins. On lands once held collectively or tilled as laborers, tribal families now hold legal rights to their orchards, an ownership rate that has climbed from just 12% before the Wadi model to 78% today. This shift is not only about paperwork, it is about self-determination. In villages across Jharkhand and Odisha, women have stepped into new roles as decision-makers, where once their labor was hidden behind the scenes, now 67% of orchard management and marketing is overseen by women's groups. Self-help collectives handle everything from planting schedules to fruit sales, pooling resources to negotiate better prices and invest in new tools. 
The impact of this empowerment becomes most visible during hardship. In the drought years of 2002 and 2003, when crops failed across much of Maharashtra, established wadi orchards held on. Contour trenches and thick mulch kept soil moisture at 70%, compared to just 20% on neighboring fields. Families prioritized water for young trees, and as a result, 85% of orchard trees survived while conventional crops withered. These orchards became lifelines, providing fruit, fodder, and timber, even as the wider landscape turned brown. For many, this resilience was the first real buffer against disaster they had ever known. Scientists and field technicians have documented another benefit growing quietly beneath the surface. Over a decade, each orchard locks away about 23 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare, measured through a combination of tree biomass and improved soil carbon. Across 81,000 hectares, the total carbon stored is immense, enough to rival some of India's largest reforestation efforts. This is not just an environmental bonus, it opens the door to future income through carbon finance. As international markets begin to value the climate benefits of well-managed agroforestry, researchers from institutions like ICAR and NABARD have verified these gains, noting that the mix of fruit and forest species outperforms monocultures, building biodiversity and restoring soil health at the same time. Climate and livelihood goals are being met together. The transformation is visible in daily life. Families who once migrated now plan for the long term, investing in their land and their children's futures. Women who managed household chores now lead producer collectives. Orchards that began as risky experiments have become symbols of security, pride, and long-term opportunity. The Wadi model's true harvest lies in these layered gains, social, economic, and environmental, woven together acre by acre. Today, 200,000 families stand as proof. The right design can turn wasteland into a source of income, dignity, and climate resilience. As billions of degraded acres worldwide await solutions, the Wadi model shows transformation starts one acre at a time, and the future belongs to those who see potential where others see loss. How will we choose to see our land? 